And I like singing those songs like uh, that infinite, marvelous, wonderful grace of God. And uh, I'm a little bit old-fashioned, I guess. So I like that. Thank you so much for the music this morning and uh, bringing us into a time of worship with God's Word. Uh, I guess, are the children going out today? Okay. So we'll let uh, the children be dismissed with the uh, leaders of our children's church. And that's an awesome opportunity for them to learn more of God's Word. It's interesting. Uh, Amy has no idea what I'm preaching on today. Uh, and she was asking you to commit to pray for five minutes for Vacation Bible School. And part of my message is actually asking you to make some commitments today and uh, very specific commitments. So I have a pass out here to kind of help us with that. So I need some ushers, maybe some guys, you two guys on the three fellows on the front row, would you come up here and help me right here? Let me get one of these sheets here. Make sure everybody gets one. I think I have one for everybody, okay? Aiden, you can help, okay? We'll get these out pretty quick. I love preaching through the Bible, preaching the Word of God. And, uh, and I, I think uh, there's no better book to preach from, talk about, teach from. But I, I feel like if we don't make application and don't put the truth uh, to uh, work in our lives and apply it to our everyday lives, uh, the preacher has failed. Uh, I never did get excited about preaching to a large crowd of people. I never got excited if... Uh, 10 or 15 or 20 people came forward to get saved in a service or even more than that or a big baptismal service. I'm, I mean, I, I shouldn't say I didn't get excited. I do get excited when those things happen. I'd probably be lying if I said I didn't get excited, okay? So, so, uh, so I do get excited, but that's not what really excites me, okay? What really excites me is not to see people at the altar praying. What excites me is to see them living out their faith Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday afternoon too. Amen? And, uh, and, and that's what we want. Jesus told us to go and make disciples, uh, a disciplined person following Jesus Christ. He didn't tell us to fill up the pews. He told us to empty the pews. <laughs> Amen? He did. He told us to empty the pews, to send people out. And uh, so we're, we're going to be talking about the book of Nehemiah for a few weeks here. Okay. So just, just go ahead and put some on the back row back there, and then we'll put them on the back sh maybe table after we're finished here. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Nehemiah, Ezra, Esther, and Nehemiah. And, uh, and maybe I said that back, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Thank you. There we go. And in my Bible, it's page 518. Okay, I'm not sure what it is in, in your uh, Bible that you brought with you, your translation. But we're going to be talking about this very interesting book, this very interesting man who did an awesome work for God. And he actually did a great work for God. And so I want to read a couple passages and then we're going to be, and I'll be telling you, actually, you'll see a little bit of the outline of the sermons that we're going to preach over the next probably about eight weeks, six to eight weeks, at least six weeks more on this as, as we look at Nehemiah. But uh, let's stand together for the reading of God's word and to begin this series of committing to a great work, committing to a great work. We're going to read Nehemiah chapter 4, a few verses, and a few verses in Nehemiah chapter 6. Then I said, and that, of course, is Nehemiah. He's writing in first person here. I said to the nobles, the rulers, and the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive, and we're separated far from one another on the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So we labored in the work. And if I was you, as I'm reading through these verses and speaking this morning, look for the word great, look for the word work, 
look for the word build or rebuild. Okay, key words as we talk about the book of Nehemiah. Our God will fight for us. So we labored in the work. And half of the men held the spears from daybreak until the stars appeared. <laughs> you know what that is? That's all day long, right? From daybreak, the day began, till the stars appeared. That's after the sun goes down for a little bit and the stars appear. These dudes work long hours. At the same time, I also said to the people, let each man and his servants stay at night in Jerusalem that they may be our guard by night and a working party by day. So neither I, my brethren, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me took off our clothes, except that everyone took them off for washing. <laughs> Amen. They, they were on guard, and they said we were working and guarding at the same time, and we're not even going to take time to take off our clothes and change clothes, except to wash them every now and then. Amen. Now, Nehemiah 6, go over a couple chapters because there's always opposition to the work of God, and it came in the form of these three guys, Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. All right, these are three bad guys, okay? And Geshem the, the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it, though at that time I had not hung the doors in the gates that Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, come, come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. And the way to remember that, oh no, is oh no, you don't want to go to oh no. <laughs> oh no, don't go there. But they thought to do me harm. So I sent messengers to them saying, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? But they sent me this message four times, and I answered them in the same manner. Then Sanballat sent his servant to me as before, the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. Now, Father, I pray in these next moments that uh, every person in here will determine that you have a plan, you have a purpose for their life, and it's a great one. It's a great one. And, and we ought to be about building a great work for God, building great families, great homes, a great church. Lord, we uh, were never encouraged just to kind of be apathetic and just kind of take it easy and hope things kind of work out. Lord, you've called your disciples to greatness, to be servants, to, to give up that which we cannot keep, to gain that which we cannot lose to lose our lives for the sake of the gospel. Lord, to make a difference in this world in which we live that's perishing all around us. So Lord, again, these next weeks as we look at this book of Nehemiah, help us, like Nehemiah said, to rise up and build. Build a great work for our God. And I ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As I was reading this passage even this morning, I thought back to a time I sat in my office and I had a missionary sitting there with me by the name of Jody Miller. Jody Miller was a computer programmer at a local um, Atlantic Mutual insurance in the community. And uh, he had been teaching Sunday school in the church and serving in different aspects of ministry as a deacon and so forth. And he had uh, one day said, hey, pastor, I believe God calls, is calling me to missions. I'd like to meet, meet with you for breakfast. And so we went out to a local restaurant and uh, he told me, he said, Pastor Mike, God wants me to go to Kuwait. <laughs> and this is during the Iraq war. And I go, God told you to go to Kuwait. And he said, yes. And I said, uh, I mean, I'm just curious. And I wasn't trying to maybe discourage him too much, but I mean, I've not had too many people come to me that so clearly telling me how God told them to do something like that, especially he has a family, his three ki little kids, you know, his wife, and uh, he's going to go to Kuwait as a missionary, which basically is a, you know, a, a Islam, a, a Muslim country and so forth. But anyway, 
he uh, ended up ended up going, and we sent him actually because I had some friends there that we had mar- did a marriage for him. They grew, the girl grew up in our church back up in Winchester, the first church I was pastor of. Uh, Carol Benjani and her husband Amal lived in uh, Mon Jordan. And so we encouraged him and his wife, if he's going to go, and I did everything I could to discourage him, to be honest with you, because I knew if it was of God, he would get there. And it would be of God. It wouldn't be because I got excited about them going. But anyway, he, he did. He went to Mon Jordan to learn Arabic and began his journey to get to Kuwait. And he was going to be a tent maker. He's going to do computer stuff and it give him an opportunity to win people to Christ there. But anyway, in the meantime, Amal and Carol Bajani, Amal got arrested and uh, got, uh, got put on an airplane and sent out of, of Jordan, and Jody got stuck with the work there. And Jody took over the ministry there in Amman, Jordan, and he got very involved in it, learned, learned Arabic, like, like, I mean, to perfection, and, and he was really being used of the Lord. And one day... He was in my office years later, probably about 10, 12 years after he'd gone there. And while we were sitting there, he said, hey, I just got a phone call from, from uh, the FBI. And they told me that uh, they have good intelligence that I have been targeted to be assassinated if I go back to Amman, Jordan. Now, his wife was still there because he came home by himself to do some things and maybe raise some support or whatever. And I'll never forget Jody sitting there and, uh, and he's saying, boy, you know, I got to decide what to do. And he's thinking, you know, my wife's there. They're telling us we're in danger. I've been targeted to be assassinated by terrorists and, uh, and, 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 and I don't know what to do. And then as he's thinking and processing it, he basically looks at me and says, you know what? If they wanted me dead, I'd already be dead. I don't hide around there. I mean, he had a cross on top of the water tank on top of, his, on top of the building that the church was in. I mean, he was unashamedly proclaiming the gospel of Christ. That's why he's having some problems. And eventually, he did get put on an airplane, got arrested, blindfolded, put in a prison for a few days, and got deported out of the country. And that's why my son ended up taking his place there. But Jody, that day, he looked at me and said, if they wanted me dead, I'd already be dead. They're not going to scare me with their threats. And he, of course, went back until the secret police took him and put him out of the country too. But I thought of him as I was reading this passage with Nehemiah because he said they wanted to scare me. They wanted to keep me from doing what God wanted me to do, this great work. And I'm telling you, my friend, God... Uh, has a great work for you. And there is some ta- sand ballots and some Tobias and some Geshems that are going to do all they can. The devil's going to do all he can to put fear in your heart to keep you from committing to do a great work for God. The devil don't, does not want you to do a great work for God. So as you read through this passages of scripture and the messages that we'll be speaking about over these next weeks, we're going to be looking at rebuilding. And, and rebuilding requires refocusing and reevaluating and reassessing, looking at where you are, where you've been, where do you plan on going? You're looking at that. You're, you're, you're seeing what kind of progress you've made. And, and you have to ask the question, how do I know if I'm doing a great work for God? Is our church doing a great work for God? In in the book of Nehemiah, the word great is used at least 20 times. Now, in the old King James Version, it's actually used 27 or 28 times, depending on how you count it. I mean, the word is used again and again and again throughout the book because God is (laughs) great is thy faithfulness. Our God is a great God. (laughs) Amen. And our God does great things, and he does it through common, ordinary people. You read the first verses of this book, and you find that Nehemiah was a common, ordinary kind of a guy, really. He was a cupbearer in a foreign land to a foreign king, and God used him to write a book. God used him to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now, great work involves several things. 
And these are the messages that we'll be preaching through in the next few weeks. A great passion. A great passion. Uh, we, if anyone should be passionate about Jesus Christ, missions, and the work of God in the church, it ought to be us. If we've been born again, washed in the blood, we know our sins forgiven. We believe there's a heaven and there's a hell. We ought to be passionate about that. We ought to have a burden. We ought to have a brokenness. We ought to believe that God has a passion for us. We should have a passion for him. We need to have great purpose. And that's a vision, a vision. Write it down, Habakkuk said. And then see that it gets fulfilled. Run with it and keep it before you. And I want to tell you, whenever you have a vision for God, we'll be looking at this, there's always the death of a vision. In other words, something happens that kills that vision. It's impossible for it to be fulfilled in your life. But then that's when God miraculously comes in and helps the vision to be fulfilled. But we need a great purpose, a great vision. We need great prayer, great prayer. Never was a work for God accomplished without great prayer. Read the Old Testament, read the New Testament, read the biographies of the missionaries and people that God used over the years. They did great praying, biblical kind of praying, passionate kind of praying, because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Amen? Great praying. That's why Amy, when she asked us to make a five-minute commitment a day to pray, we need to pray because prayer locks up Satan, so to speak, frees the captives, and brings forth God's blessings and his help to bring people to faith in Jesus Christ and gives us the strength and the courage to do what God wants us to do. Amen. There is no substitute for prayer. Nothing of eternal value ever happens apart from prayer. And that's so important. We'll be, lock, we'll be talking and doing a whole message. And when you read the book of Nehemiah, I can tell you this, Nehemiah, we're going to see it page after page, chapter after chapter. He was a praying man. He was a praying man. And that's why God used him to do a great work. Amen. Are you still with me? Okay. Now, <laughs> whenever you attempt to work for God, there will be great problems. There will be great opposition and obstacles. Okay. There was the poverty of some of the Jews. There was the rubbish. And, 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 and that's probably, of all the messages, going to be my favorite message. Because if I've not had a problem or in a problem, I just came out of a problem. And I know there's a problem just around the corner for me and my family and my life and ministry. I mean, life is full of trouble and problems and difficulties. Just read the stories of David through the Psalms as we're doing it in the mornings. There's opposition. The enemies of greatness are always just lurking around the corner to keep you from continuing to do the great work for God. You say, here I am, Lord, use me. I can tell you, you just put a target on your back for Satan or your front. It doesn't matter. He will do all he can to oppose you. He's happy with you sitting in the pew doing nothing, accomplishing nothing for the sake of eternity. And we're going to see it takes a great price. A great price has to be paid. A great price has to be paid. There has to be sacrifice if God's great work is going to be done. A church like Friendly Community Baptist Church just didn't happen. There was a price that was paid to bring together this facility, this building, these people. A price was paid. And every church and every great work for God a price and a sacrifice has to be made. And we have to be willing to make that sacrifice for the glory of God if we're going to see a great work accomplished. There's a great price to pay if we want a great vacation Bible school to win boys and girls to Jesus Christ. A great price to pay if we're going to make a difference in Burgall, North Carolina, and bring this community. A great price to pay if we're going to see America come back to God. Amen? 
a great pro we'll be talking about that. And then you'll notice great progress. If you get those first six in order, I'll guarantee you, you will see great progress in your life for the glory of God. Amen? Great progress will take place. It says, and the wall, and I'm, I'm telling you, if you could just picture the city of Jerusalem, like we've been there so many times, and, uh, and, and those walls, and to think that in 52 days, you know, 52 days is less than what? Two months. 52 days is less than two months. In 52 days, the walls were rebuilt. Amazing. With all the opposition, all the organization, and all the things that got involved in rebuilding those walls. And we're going to talk about that as we deal with the problems. But it got done in 52 days. 52 days. And, and that's specific in the scripture there in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15, in 52 days. And not only do you see those greats, and we won't have time to preach on the great protection that God gave the people, the great provision that he provided for them, and the great plenty also that took place as they attempted to do a great work for God. Amen? Now, on your piece of paper... We're going to kind of ask you, kind of, we're not going to kind of, because we're going to do it. <laughs> I don't know how you kind of do something. You either do it or you don't do it, right? We're going to ask you to make a 52-day commitment. You know, they tell me, they tell me that it takes 21 days to form a habit. Do the same thing 21 days. It, it's amazing. I, I didn't always get up early in the morning over the years. I started out getting up early, but the older I got, the harder it got. And, uh, and, and, uh, and so, anyway, when COVID hit back in 2020, something happened. And I just felt like they shut down everything. We, we shut down the church temporarily, but we didn't do it very long because I just didn't feel like that was of God. And uh, we... Uh, but we knew we had to connect because a lot of people were going to come to church. And you know what it did here. And, and I just felt like somehow or another we needed to connect. And start, I started doing a five-day, uh, a five-minute daily little chat on social media because everybody's going to social media to stay, you know, uh, to keep from being totally isolated socially. And so I started doing that five, but I had to get up in the morning to do it. And I started waking up between five and uh, 5 uh, 30 in I'm sorry between 4 and 4 30 in the morning I just would wake up and I thought well I'm awake I'm gonna do it right now because I want it posted before 7 7 30 and so I, I woke up and guess what happened it wasn't long but I didn't set an alarm never set an alarm so since COVID I've not ever said you can ask my wife I have not set an alarm and every morning I wake up about the exact same time. Now, some of that has to do with maybe my age and I have to get up and use the restroom. I'm not sure, but uh, <laughs> I know you'd get a smile from that. But, uh, but literally, you, you start doing, if you do something for 52 days every day, for 52 days, it's okay to form good habits. Don't worship your habits, though. Worship the Lord because you're doing the right thing. Amen? And so we'll see that take place, I believe, as we talk about these 52-day, these commitments. And I'm going to finish with that at the end. But let's go back to Nehemiah, okay? Nehemiah, go back to chapter 1, he was a cupbearer to the king, the king of Persia, King Cyrus, or actually King, king Artaxerxes. And, uh, and, and to kind of get things in order, the people of Israel had sinned and sinned, committed idolatry, and they were taken into Babylonian captivity around 587 B.C., somewhere thereabout. Uh, and then after 70 years of captivity under the Babylons, like Nebuchadnezzar, the book of Daniel, the book of Ezekiel, uh, Babylon fell to the Medes and the Persians in about 539 B.C., 539 B.C. It was then that Cyrus fulfilled the prophecy of Jeremiah 
in 538 that allowed Zerubbabel to go back with the first group of exiles to start rebuilding the temple. They went back to rebuild the temple. And in so 536 B.C., see, they rebuild the altar, the foundations laid, and finished it in 516, but it took 20 years to finish the building of that temple. 20 years, because they got delayed, delayed. And that's when you read the book of Haggai, the book of Zechariah, these two prophets, they come along and they're saying, hey, what are you doing? You're, you've quit building the temple. You're out here building your houses. You're putting money in your pockets. But I want to tell you, your pockets have holes in them. God's house needs to be rebuilt. Amen. Read the book of Haggai and these prophets. So they encouraged them. And finally, by 516 B.C., it's built. Then King Artaxerxes allowed Ezra to return about 80 years after Zerubbabel. Okay. And Ezra was a priest. And that's the book of Ezra. I love the book of Ezra. So he goes back and his goal is to restore the people spiritually. He was a scribe. He was a teacher of the word of God. But then Nehemiah comes back 12 years after Ezra in about 444 BC. Zerubbabel came to rebuild the temple. Nehemiah came to rebuild the walls about 90 years later. And that kind of gives you a perspective of the history of a whole lot of books in the Old Testament, okay? Ezra, Nehemiah, uh, Esther, and then the minor prophets. They all kind of fall under a lot of this period of time. Now, Nehemiah, though, was a cupbearer to the king back in uh, Persia, in Sushan, the palace, it says. Um, now, one, cup, one commentator said that he was more than just a cupbearer. And you got a picture, a, a cupbearer to the king. He was someone, you know what a cupbearer to the king mainly did in those days? Somebody's always trying to kill the king. <laughs> Slipping poison in his drink to get rid of him. So the cupbearer, you know what he had to do? He had to taste it first. And if he didn't die, then the king could drink it. Right? He had a really good job. And, uh, but, but, but some commentators believe that Nehemiah was a very popular person in the court of King Artaxerxes. And as you read the context, you get the idea of this too. And he was more than a cupbearer. He might have been even a sort of a prime minister, a master of ceremonies, all in one. He was a royal favorite in the palace of the king. Now, Josephus, the historian, the Jewish historian, he tells the story in his words that Nehemiah was out walking one evening, just getting some fresh air. And he overheard some of the travelers conversing together in the Hebrew tongue. And as he heard his mother tongue in Hebrew, his heart was moved and he asked them about Jerusalem. And they told him, well, the walls are in rubbish. They're torn down. It's a sad state of affairs. Now, remember, this is about 90 years after Zerubbabel went back to rebuild the temple, and the Jews had been going back somewhat, but many of them got content to stay in Babylon. Many of them got content to stay in Shushan. I'm afraid many Christians are content to live at ease in the world. I didn't even get an amen. I got one, I think. But that's the truth. Amen. And so there is Nehemiah. He's got a pretty good position. He's pretty secure. I mean, except if he gets some poison in somebody's drink that gives to him. But he's doing all right in his position. And so he asked about Jerusalem. And when he hears, read chapter 1, and we'll come back to this, I'm sure. But when he re hears about the state of affairs with the walls of Jerusalem, his heart is broken. And Nehemiah appears to be a man of faith. Nehemiah is a man who has a love for Jerusalem, the place of worship. And Nehemiah must be already a consecrated, hard-working man, a diligent kind of a person. And no doubt, as you read through the book of Nehemiah, and I'm convinced of this, his heart was stirred by God. 
stirred by God. God stirred his heart up. God had him over here, over here, these people talking. God put in his heart to ask, how are things? And then as he heard, his heart was broken and he fell uh, before God and begged God for help. He, he, he was stirred by God. And, and I'm telling you, if we're going to do a great work for God, I believe we're going to have to be stirred by God. He has to stir us. Our families are falling apart. Our country's falling apart. Our teenagers are committing suicide. I'm telling you, we need to be stirred by God if we're going to see a great work for God. We need to fill up our churches with people that need Jesus Christ. It doesn't just happen. It happens because they see something on fire and they want to come see what's burning. <laughs> Amen. I heard the story about old country church out in a little village somewhere and, and it caught on fire one evening and it's on fire and it's burning down and the old village drunk came and was standing there watching the church burn down and somebody looked at him and said, oh, 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 I hadn't seen you at church in a long time. And he says, well, I've never seen the church on fire before either. Amen. It gets on fire, something will happen. We get on fire, something will happen. Stirred by God. Have you ever been stirred by God to build a great life, to build a great family, to build a great church, to build a great witness for the glory of God? I want to tell you, it gets real exciting when you get stirred by God. I know when I got saved, God stirred my heart. I have to be the shyest person on planet Earth. Somehow or another in grade school, like the fourth grade, when they made you do oral reports, I got a phobia. Maybe somebody laughed at me, mocked me or something when I had to get up in front of the class and do an oral book report. Anybody remember the days when you had to do oral book reports in front of the old class? Something happened that put a phobia inside me. Did, I still have a problem if I'm in a group of five or six pastors and all we have to do is say, my name is Mike Grooms and I'm from such and such place and I pastor such and such church. That's all I got to say. But as it gets closer and closer to my time to say it, my heart starts pounding. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, goodness. I've been preaching for 30, 40 years. <laughs> really good. You just get nervous about getting up front. Oh, if you only knew. But God stirred my heart as a new Christian, to tell the world about Jesus Christ. And that's what I've just tried to do. And I can tell you this, it is worth it. It is worth it. I, uh, yesterday, and I missed it. I didn't even see it till this morning. I didn't even see it till this morning. But yesterday I got a message text from a, a West Virginia guy that, uh, and I hope he's not listening because I really don't re I don't remember a whole lot of things. This is my first church that I'm pastoring, Shindo Valley Baptist Church up the 81 up northern uh, up northern Virginia, and uh, and he wrote yesterday, "Hi, Pastor Mike. Today is a very special day. Fifty years ago, you led me to the Lord, and I want to thank you for leading me to the Lord as my Savior." I wish I could tell you I've lived for the Lord for all 50 years every day, but that would be a lie. But Jesus never left me nor forsook me. He always had his arms open wide with love to bring me back to him. Praise the Lord, what a Savior he is. Thank you again for leading me to the Lord. God bless you, Pastor Mike. Bless all your family, love in Christ, Kent, Kent Davis. Now, I'm telling you, you start getting notes like that and don't even remember how God used you 50 years ago. You, you will be blessed and you'll say it's worth it all. Whatever it cost, whatever it took. Now, let me just, a couple things here. The word built is used six times in Nehemiah 3 and it basically is maybe translated rebuilt. They are rebuilding. The walls were down. They're rubble. They're rebuilding. The word repair is used 35 times, repair, 35 times in the book of Nehemiah to make strong, to make firm, because Nehemiah wasn't interested in a quick fix, a whitewashed wall that would soon crumble. 
I mean, they were building for the glory of God, and they, Nehemiah was determined, we're going to do our best. Give it our best. God's work does, deserves the best. Amen. Read the building of the tabernacle in the temple. It was the best. Nothing, nothing sloppy about it. The gates of Jerusalem had been destroyed by fire. And so Nehemiah requisitioned timber from the king's force, had new gates constructed, Nehemiah 2.8, put in place. And the gates were very important to the safety of the people and the control of everyone that went in and out of the city. God, listen, the scripture tells in Psalm 87 verse 2, the Lord loves the gates of Zion. He loves gates. He loves the fact that one day we were told by Jesus, I am the gate. I am the door by me if any man enter in. Gates of safety, gates of entrance. They're secure gates when God's people builds them. We ought to love them too. Now, locks and bars are mentioned five times in the book of Nehemiah. The locks refer to the sockets into which the bars were fitted, thus making it difficult for anyone outside to open the gates. See, it's not enough that we simply do the work of God. We need to make sure what we do is protected from the enemy. You can build a great family, but if you're not careful and you don't protect that family from the enemy, he can come in and steal those kids, those grandkids. We've got to protect that which God wants us to build. The church needs to be protected. And it only gets protected as we are fervent in our prayers and in our love for the Lord Jesus Christ and we continue to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And so today, I want to challenge you on a 52-day journey. Nehemiah 6.15, so the wall was finished on the 25th day in Elo, Elo, Elo. Somebody else have to tell me how to pronounce that verse. In 52 days, that word of the month, in 52 days. And it happened when all our enemies heard of it and all the nations around us saw these things that they were disheartened in their own eyes for they, listen to this, for they perceived that this work was done by our God. Amen. The people didn't say, well, look what Nehemiah did. Look what those people did. They perceived that it was done by God. Now, wouldn't that be the most amazing thing that God just brings that pastor here that God wants to be the pastor because we pray like we should? And then this church explodes with growth, reaching teenagers, young people, the community for Christ. Revival, reformation spreads across this community throughout North Carolina because it's a great work of God. Wouldn't that be awesome? It can happen if we believe and we set our heart to be committed to what God wants. And so I'm challenging you to a 52-day journey with Nehemiah and rebuilding some things in your life, rebuilding things in our church, rebuilding things in our family. The Bible tells us in the book of James that faith without works is dead. The word build, I don't know about you. I actually in college helped build houses. I studied to be an architect. I thought at one time I was going to be an engineer architect. And uh, then I got involved in construction building. And, 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 and even, even, even before I was 20 years old and got saved, I was very involved. And building, and I can tell you this, building requires work. <laughs> Amen? A lot of work. The, listen, the word build is used over 130 times in the Old Testament, and the word build or built is used over 30 times in the New Testament. God's interested in building. He really is. Matter of fact, look in Ephesians, look in Matthew 16, 18. Jesus himself said, upon this rock, I will make my church appear. I just, out of nothing, it's going to appear. He didn't say that. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And it took the work of salvation, the work of the resurrection of Christ, the handiwork of God to bring that about. I will build. Ephesians 2.20. Look at the many times the word build shows up in Ephesians 2.20 20 through 22. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, 
He's talking about the church, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. Amen. A great work for God. Now, what is the work of God? What is the great work of God? What does God want? Look in John chapter 6. Jesus said it very clearly. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor, work, for the food that perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God. Is it on the screen? What's the work of God? That you believe on him whom God has sent. Amen. That's the work of God, to believe, to believe. And I'm going to tell you, the devil will do everything he can to keep you from really believing. But when you believe that this is the work of God, awesome things can take place. And so this morning, will you accept the challenge to get up and build, to get up and build? 52 days. Now, what I have written on the other side here, or typed out myself, and what I want you to do is take this little piece of paper, fold it over, okay? And I want you to put it in your Bible. Now, did you notice we're not starting today? We're not starting next Sunday. And I have a reason for that. You know why? Because I know this, everybody's not here today. And everybody won't be here next Sunday. But in three Sundays, a good number of people will be here. <laughs> they come to church regularly. We just don't all come the same Sunday anymore. Amen? Isn't that how it works? So I want to get as many people on this wagon train as I can. All right? So I'm gonna, you'll, be, you'll be getting this next Sunday again. But I don't have to give you a new one because you got this one. Now, you go ahead and do what Amy asked you to do and start. Did you notice the very first commitment is what? Prayer. And, just, and, and, and like I said, I had this down before I ever heard Amy get up and say what she said. She didn't know what I was going to say. But I'm asking you to commit for five minutes a day. Okay, you can start today if you want to. But we're going to start it together as a group, a church, for 52 days. A few years ago, there was a 90-day challenge for workout. Anybody remember that 90-day workout challenge, the 90-day power workout thing? Anybody remember that? What was it called? 90-day fit. fit. And we had a lot of young guys and people, oh, we're going to do 90 days getting shaped shape here. My son was one of them, Nathan. And you know what we got to thinking with our staff? Why not do that spiritually? So we made a 90-day challenge for people to read through the entire Bible in 90 days. I mean, that's pretty extreme. That's going to take a little bit of time every day. And you know what happened? People accepted that challenge, and we still have people talking about what happened in those 90 days to get them in the habit of regularly reading through their Bible. It's an amazing thing that happened, and we hear about it still even today. So daily things you can do. Now, there are not 52 things here because I'm not asking you to do 52 things, but I'm asking you to pick out some things that you will do that you know in your life aren't there today that need to be rebuilt, like read your Bible every day, okay? Pray every day. Pray every day for a missionary. Pray every day for an unreached people group. So I listed some unreached people groups and a website, if you want to study a little bit about them, the Joshua Project will tell you exactly who these people are, where they live in the world, if there's a witness, not a witness, how many believers there are. It's a great website, the Joshua Project. We use it all the time to research unreached people groups in the world. And so pray for, pray for an unreached people group. Read a psalm, read a proverb. Just, I'm not asking you to take 10 hours, but did you realize in 52 days, 
just, just a challenge for some of us, not all of us, but maybe you would accept this challenge. 20 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day, you could read the entire New Testament in 52 days or listen to it. I'm not going to embarrass you, but how many of you watch TV more than 20 minutes a day? Or you look at your iPhone or your iPad or your Android more than 20 minutes a day. You're on Facebook more than 20 minutes a day. Now, I'm just asking, don't you think it'd be much more beneficial to have God's word coming into your head than what you're seeing on social media or on the news? You know I'm right. (laughs) Don't look at me like a cow looking at a new gate, okay? A calf, a calf, a calf looking at a new gate. So, So I just got several areas. Now, you can add to this. But you journal it, write it down, put it in your Bible, and we're going to talk about this for the next two Sundays. And then on the 25th, we're going to say, all right, we're going to pray. And for 52 days, we're starting this journey. And we're going to see God do something awesome. Bring us the pastor God wants us to have. Amen? Speak to our church about, did you see the witnessing? Did you see that? How about just passing out one track in 52 days. How about witnessing to one person in the 52 days, opening up your mouth and saying, inviting one person to church, making that, just inviting one person to church in those 52 days. We'd be shocked what would happen. Rebuild, build for the glory of God. Amen? Let's pray. Now, Father, I thank you for this wonderful wonderful church that you planted you planted here in this community and you didn't plan us to sit around and tickle each other's ears and scratch each other on the back and try to make each other feel good even though that's part of our fellowship and that's okay lord you put us here because people are perishing there's a world that needs jesus christ people are dying and going into a christless eternity And nobody's telling them. You looked on the fields and they were white already to harvest. You were moved with compassion as you looked at the lost sheep in the fields. And you were willing to leave the 99 in the fold to go after the one, after the one that was lost. So Lord, oh God, give us a stirring of our hearts. Give us a passion, a burden, a heart to pray, a heart to work a heart to see what you want to do in this church as we by faith believe you and trust you. So Lord, use this series over these next weeks to stir us up for the glory of God that we might do a great work for God. Let us rise up and build, Nehemiah said. And the people had a mind to work, had a heart to work. God, do that here in our midst, we pray. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, Could I ask this morning, right now, some of you are saying and thinking and praying, and you're saying, Pastor, I I believe God would want me to make a 52-day commitment when we start this in a couple weeks, or even today, I'll start doing some of these things for the glory of God. And you'd say, that's me. Our heads are bowed. Nobody's going to embarrass you. But you just right now lift your hand and say, I I know I'm willing to make a 52-day commitment of some sort for the glory of God. Would you lift your hand right now? Teenagers, young people, I will, by the grace of God, want to make that commitment. And Father in heaven, I thank you that you're going to do what only you can do. We love you. And Lord, maybe there's someone here today that needs to take that first step, and that's receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And if you're here today and you're not saved or you're watching by live stream, you don't have that assurance of your heart that Jesus Christ has forgiven you for your sins. I'm telling you, that's what really the church is all about. God loves you. Jesus came and died for you. He was buried. He rose again the third day. That's the gospel. That's the good news. There's hope. There's salvation. There's peace. There's forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. Would you come to Jesus? 
Would you open your heart to Jesus? Would you look to Jesus on the cross and be saved? Believe he's a risen Savior. He has the authority, the power to make you one of his children. Would you believe that today? This is the work of God that you believe on him whom the Father has sent. Would you believe in Christ today? Would you trust him? You could pray right now, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me for my sins. I believe you. You love me. You died for me. I need a Savior desperately. I need a Savior. Come into my heart, I pray. Lord, that's our prayer, even today. Right in this place, some people are trusting you to be their Savior. Maybe by live stream, they're trusting you to be their Savior. Right now, people are saying, Lord, here am I. Send me. Send me. Open my eyes. Open my heart. Stir my heart, oh Lord, today to do a great work for God. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And all God's people say, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful, glorious day. Amen.